once said, who was wiser than I? When I was young, I wanted to change the world. As I got older, I want to change myself. The Buddha said, the entire world exists in this fathom-long body, fingertip to fingertip. That the world we can create exists inside of us. The world that we can change exists inside of us. And rather than looking out for the answers, one can start looking in. For a Buddhist, it starts with the three poisons. The Buddha warned us. He said, you have greed, you have hatred, and you have delusion. And those three things change the way you experience the world. What you need to do over time is change the greed into generosity, the hatred into love and kindness, and the delusion into wisdom, seeing things the way they really are. When I first came to Buddhism, I wasn't sure what compassion was, or what even loving kindness was. I'd always had the word love not necessarily connected to kindness. And the word love can be self-serving. It can be a relationship that one controls, wants to last forever. Businessmen's love, I'll do this for you if you did this for me. All sorts of ways to look at love. The word could also be used in loving your shoes, loving your car, loving your wife, loving your house. One word. And I'm thinking to myself, that is so confusing. And then I came to Buddhism and I found something called a loving kindness reflection. And the word love always seemed to be connected to kindness, as if kindness would balance, would temper all the negative aspects of love as I knew them. And with love and kindness working together, we had something called middle path love. But I didn't know how to get it. How do you find that? How do you put that inside of you? How do you upload all that information so it can help you through your daily activities? Well, I started to recite the loving kindness meditation in the morning. And it starts with me, and I sort of like that idea. And it goes like this, may I be happy, peaceful, and free from suffering. May no harm come to me, may no difficulties come to me, may no problems come to me. May I always find fulfillment, may I also have patience, courage, understanding, and determination to meet and overcome the inevitable difficulties, problems, and failures in life. So I thought to myself, yeah, that's how I want to think. I want to have peace and love and kindness and fulfillment. And I know there are going to be an infinite amount of obstacles preventing me from getting there, and I need to be patient, and I need to be kind to myself. Now the second verse is rather abstract. It goes like this, some of the words that I use in my own personal meditation. May my parents, partners, pets, brothers and sisters, friends and relatives, all the people I don't know, all the people I don't like, may they too be happy, peaceful, and free from suffering, etc. Now in reflecting on those words, I realized there were two categories that were just amazing to think about. Number one, all the people I don't know, may they too be happy, peaceful, and free from suffering. How many people don't I know? About seven billion. Seven billion people, I'm going to be pushing out the love and the kindness to all those that I will never meet. Now, 
How did that change my life when I accepted that as part of my practice? I find now when I walk into a room or, or, or setting with a bunch of strangers, they no longer look that strange. In fact, they look sort of familiar. Like I've seen them before, but I can't really remember where or how or what the circumstances were. But can you imagine walking on the streets of a major city with millions of people and looking at all those people and they look familiar? There's no fear. There's no loneliness or separateness. They're part, they're part of your community, your personal community. So sometimes I'll walk up to people like I did today and say, Hi, how are you? No hesitation. One woman came to me and said, I bet you don't remember me, do you? I said, no, but it's my fault, not yours. But even though I didn't remember her, she still looked familiar. So I said, well, nice to see you again for the first time. <laughs> Which is how my life is going as I get older and older. Everybody I'm seeing again for the first time, even myself. Now, after that, all the people I don't like. When I was younger, the list was very long with the people I didn't like. As I get older, the list gets shorter. There are less people that I don't like. And it has to do with me, of course. But when I see someone I don't like, I don't like the qualities that I see in them that reflect me. They've become a mirror. And I see some of the issues that I haven't resolved yet in my own life, in my own person. And I'm projecting out to them because I can't look in the mirror and see it yet in myself, but I can see it clearly in them. And now I'm going to say to them, may you be happy, peaceful, and free from suffering, even though I don't like you, because I have issues. <laughs> and that allows me to just be a little kinder in my day with all the strangers I meet and all the people that I don't want to be around doesn't mean I'm going to give up my boundaries. It doesn't mean I'm not going to say no. What it does mean, though, is I'm going to create boundaries and say no in kindness. I don't have to be mean or sarcastic. I can be kind when I say no. And I can be kind when I leave the room because I don't want their company any longer. I don't have to make them feel bad about that. Now the third part of this loving-kindness meditation sort of goes like this. All those who have come to our world or in the universe with only consciousness and without consciousness, with perception and without perception, with legs and without legs, may they too be happy, peaceful, and free from suffering. So I'm talking about that cockroach I'm looking at, at 3 o'clock in the morning, and I'm going, you know, you're not supposed to be here. This is my space, and you have the rest of the world to occupy. But if I really understand that loving kindness, I'm not going to have the first thought of, well, I'll just kill it and go back to sleep. Because now I'm practicing this love and this kindness. And I'm going to be creative in the way I meet the situation. So I say to myself, maybe I can catch the little guy. Maybe I can get a jar and cover him or her and then put a little piece of paper underneath the jar so he can't run away and take the little guy outside and let him go so he can have his world and I can have my world. And it works with flies and mosquitoes harder with ants because there's always a thousand of them hard to catch them all but what it does it gives you a moment to pause and look at the value of life from the lowest to the highest with form and without everything 
on this planet has a value. Not in itself, but the value we give it. And this loving kindness meditation allows us to see the value of the life around us and the value of our own life. Now, I've been living at the meditation center in downtown Los Angeles, Koreatown, for 23 years. And over those years, we have had various pets, dogs and cats and birds and fish. Now we're down to eight cats and 30 goldfish. And long ago, I was assigned the task to feed them and keep them healthy. Take them to the vet if they're sick. Find ways to keep them warm if they're cold. And at first it was a duty. It was one of the requirements for me to live at the center as a monk, that that was my job to care for the animals. And then as time went on, it wasn't a job, it became a practice. A practice of generosity. A practice of commitment. It wasn't like giving a dollar to the Red Cross. And that's fine, and oftentimes that's appropriate. But I wanted something I could be involved in on a daily basis. Some way that I could practice this love and this kindness and this generosity as I start to get rid of my greed in a daily way. So in the morning we have feeding and the cats mass up. First time I've seen them all together in 12 hours and they're all, they have their different places to eat because sometimes they get a little aggressive with the other cats and I figure that out so some of them eat over here and some of them eat over here and some eat first because they're the alphas and then some eat last because they're the new ones that joined the colony. We never went out and got a cat. They just sort of ended up in the backyard. We have four houses side by side, all fenced in, and somehow they knew when the feeding time was. And once you feed them, there's really no reason for them to go anyplace else, it turns out. Then we have the fish. We have 20 to 30 goldfish. We have a pond in the backyard and a little water filter. And, and it's, it's nice. It's very pleasant. I love to hear the sound of the water. And I feed them twice a day during the summer and once a day during the winter. Their, their metabolism <laughs> is connected to the water temperature. And people ask me, well, why do you do that? I mean, can't they... Why don't you just give the cats away? Or why don't you send them to the pound and let them find some place? Well, I tell them, you know, I've given them all names. They've all become my friends. I talk to them on a daily basis. They don't understand what I say, but they feel what I say. And they all look up to me as, as their feeder and caretaker. The Bodhisattva vow, I will save all sentient beings, all beings with feelings, and cats surely have feelings, and fish have feelings as well. So I continue to feed them, and now other people are helping me, donating money, and they're becoming <coughs> part of the generosity that I practice. And the world is a better place because of that, I think. Now there was a book written in the 80s called How Can I Help by Ram Dass. And in that, there was a chapter of a woman who lived in New York City. And New York City was very expensive to live in, and she had a, a moderate job, not making as much money as she would like to. And yet, she saw the need to practice generosity, because there were a lot of homeless people in her neighborhood. But she wondered how, with her limited income, she could practice generosity. So she asked Ram Dass. And Ram Dass said, well, it's good to have a generosity budget. Figure out how much money you can give away each week. That'll be your generosity budget. And then when all that money is given away, you have to wait till the next week to start giving again. You have to do it in a way that includes compassion and wisdom. So she did. And in her small way, she was helping people have a better life because of her practice of generosity. Now the question comes, well, what if you give this money to someone who's going to buy drugs or alcohol 
aren't you enabling them to get intoxicated? And I've come to understand that basically, no, it's very hard to control anybody else's behavior, even if you want the best for them. And you're not really giving them that dollar to have a better life. You're giving them that dollar because you have too much greed, and that generosity you're practicing will balance your greed and ultimately get rid of it. Dig it up from the root. So you won't have to be greedy again. Now I've been practicing for a really long time, since 1979, and I still, I still have greed. And it manifests in the most surprising ways. Usually at food for less. <laughs> in the bakery aisle. And there they are, hostess cupcakes individually wrapped eight to a carton, under two dollars and fifty cents. So while I'm buying my 24 cans of cat food, I get eight Hostess cupcakes as well and march up to the checker. Now, I could buy and have the intention with these cupcakes to give half of them away, which would be a wonderful practice of generosity because I don't need to eat eight, really. But I never do. I find some way to eat all eight of them and have a wonderful time doing it. So I still, I still have work to do. I still have that little grasping to the sweetness of the cupcakes and the texture as it rolls around on your tongue and then that cold glass of milk to wash it down. And it just creates this desire and this craving to replicate that experience over and over again. And I need to just say, every moment is the first moment and maybe I don't need eight cupcakes today. Maybe I can wait a week or two weeks and then get eight cupcakes. And maybe after the two weeks, I'll only want four cupcakes. So I won't get the whole box. I'll get them individually wrapped and just take four. And maybe in another ten years, I won't want them at all. You know? But I'm sure something else will take their place. And I'll be consuming that then. So that's how my practice of kindness and generosity began. But I want to share another practice that I have. And this is a practice of, of kindness and love for those in our life that are having a difficult situation. And generally it happens with health. The older I get, the more the, the more sensitive I am to my own personal health issues. I have Medicare, I'm lucky I have that. I have Kaiser Permanente, always emailing me to remind me to do this or that, or get this test or that test, or you're too fat, or you're not fat enough, and you need more exercise, and why don't you try walking, and blah, 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 blah. So I, I ignore it as much, best I can. But then there are other people in my life. I have a Facebook page, and I have a lot of Facebook friends, and there's a fellow in... Australia, who has brain cancer. And he went in for the operation and now he has radiation to go through and, and if you know anything about cancer, sometimes the radiation is worse than the operation. So I've added him to my prayer list. I created a prayer list as well as I have a generosity list for the cats and the fish and, and sometimes people, but now I want to have a kindness and love list for the people that need support in a spiritual way. There's another woman, Leisure World, Seal Beach. For two years I've gone there. We've had a monthly Buddhist meeting. It's been wonderful. She has liver cancer. She's been added to my prayer list. Another woman who lives in Indiana who I met at a retreat 13 years ago. I found her on Facebook and wanted to friend her and say, Hi, how are you? And I did. Hi, how are you? The response was, I have lung cancer. Please pray for me. She's been added to my prayer list. So each morning I have this little ritual that I go through. 
loving kindness for myself first need to love myself a lot because I make a lot of mistakes still and I need to be kind when I do and forgive me and then all those other people in my life who I know and don't know who are relatives that aren't and then all the creatures that walk on this earth and fly on this earth and swim on this earth I need to be sensitive to them too I need to we have love and kindness for all of them and then I need to have this sort of spiritual connection to people who are in need and need support now some people think prayer helps could you know I, I'm not sure but I do it anyway it's part of what I do and 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 I see that my life has benefited dramatically because I have been kind to others. Not necessarily that the others will be kind to me, but I have the ability to accept that now, that I didn't before. Because to a lot of people, I am the other, I am the stranger, I dress weird, I talk about secular humanism, we call it Buddhism and then they're not quite sure what category to put me in and the older and more unique I become there are less categories I fit in pretty soon it's just me so how do you find a way to accept me well a lot of people don't but I can accept them for not accepting me I can be comfortable with that I can understand that I can still share my love and kindness with them and perhaps if I share enough with them, they will look at my face and see love and kindness being flashed back, mirrored back to them. They'll see their own loving kindness in my face. And they'll feel better about me because they'll feel better about themselves. It's a long journey, it's a hard journey, it's one that's necessary. And if that's the case, if that's the case, we all have the ability to do it as long as we can breathe. We don't even have to speak it out loud. We can just run it through our memory, upload the information. May I be happy, peaceful, and free from suffering. Keep uploading it. And if we keep uploading it, it will change the way we speak and change the way we act. So have a wonderful day today. Enjoy the weather and enjoy all the people that you don't know. Thank you.